This is section 2.1, the derivative and the tangent line problem. We briefly talked about this in the last chapter, uh, near the beginning of the chapter that is. Uh, now we're going to delve into that tangent line problem a little bit more deeply. So to give you a little bit of a historical perspective, uh, there were four major problems that European mathematicians were working on during the 17th century. The tangent line problem, which is what we're going to talk about today, the velocity and acceleration problem, the minimum and maximum problem, and the area problem. Each of these problems involves the notion of a limit, and calculus uh, can't be introduced with any of those four, and I've chosen to start with the tangent line problem. So first of all, let's just talk about what it means to be tangent to a curve at a point. Um, so basically what we're going to have to envision is if we have a function and let's say it looks like this. The tangent line at a point P, let's say point P is right there, um, is going to, at, in that locality, so near point P, that's going to be the only point that the curve touches that, I'm sorry, that the, that's going to be the only point that the tangent line touches the curve. However, if you extend that line, it is possible that you'll cross through the function again, um, like that did. And of course, there's possibly another point of intersection down below, depending on what happens to f when x is negative. Um, that's certainly OK for the um, tangent line to intersect the curve again. But at least close to that uh, point, that's the only point of tangency, the only point there where the function and the line meet. And as I postulated the other day um, when we were talking about this before, what we can do is we can set up some point Q that's not where P is, and we can find the secant line that is a line that passes through that curve at two specified places, uh, P and Q, and the slope of that is something we can actually get. So let me do some labeling of things here. Um, let's let this be x equals c, and where Q is, that'll be c plus delta x, as I defined earlier, which means moving from here to here we're moving over delta x. And so the coordinates of point P would be C comma F of C, that is putting the x value C into the function and calculating the y value. And Q will have the coordinates C plus delta x comma F of that x value C plus delta x. And the slope of the secant from point P to point Q, represented by M for slope and subscript SEC for secant, will be the regular slope formula given two points, y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. So this is a precalculus notion that you already have. Um, using the limit is what's going to get us into the calculus aspect of this. So I'm going to think of the second point as Q. So this will be the y-coordinate of Q, f of c plus delta x, minus the y-coordinate of point P, which is f of c, divided by the x-coordinate of point Q, which is c plus delta x minus the x-coordinate of point P, which is c. 
And you might notice that the denominator, at least, simplifies when you collect like terms. C minus C, of course, is zero, leaving delta x. And so um, what that's describing is the distance uh, from point P to point Q is the numerator, f of c plus delta x minus f of c, which is our change in y from point p to point q, and uh, delta x is our change in x. Now, it turns out that the closer you get the two points together and P is going to be fixed in place that's that's going to stay there but Q can move so if I put Q at a slightly different position let's say right here uh, well I can do it anywhere I suppose um, how about right here last time I only pictured Q on the right side and that's not good because it can um, be on either side And that's on the left side. But if I were to continue moving that left side point closer and closer to where P is, and here I've got a, a line that looks about like this. Um, it turns out that the closer Q is to P, the closer the slope of the secant line is to the slope of the tangent line. So as Q approaches P, the slope of the secant line approaches the slope of the tangent line. And so um, what that implies then is, written as a limit, is that we'll want to take the limit um, of the slope of the secant formula as Q approaches P. And one way to make Q approach P is to say, well, let's let delta X, the change in X, the horizontal distance between point P and point Q, let that shrink. That will put them closer together. And in fact, let's take the limit as that change in X, the horizontal distance between them, heads towards zero. And of course, by substitution, that becomes the slope of the secant formula that we have above in its simplified form is this. And that will approximate the slope of the tangent line uh, for any point P and point Q. But as delta x approaches zero, if we actually take the limit, the slope of the secant line actually converges toward and is the slope of the tangent line. And so that's not an approximately equal to over there to the right. That's an equals. And that's how we're going to find the slope of the tangent line is with that limiting process. Um, there's some good pictures in figure 2.4. So you can see what's happening as delta x approaches zero and the uh, s the slope of the the secant line gets closer and closer to being the slope of the tangent line and those are pretty good pictures to look at so what we have here is our slope formula and i think i said this the other day as well instead of using m subscript tan for slope of the tangent line since that's the slope of the tangent line and we're always looking for that, we're just going to simply call that the slope m. We very rarely will actually want a lot to do with the slope of the secant line except as an approximation technique for getting toward the slope of the tangent line. So let's do an example of that.
So let's look at example one. We have the function given f of x equals 2x minus 3. And we want to find the slope of that graph when c is 2. Okay, so applying our definition of the slope of the tangent line, this will be the limit as delta x approaches 0 of f of 2, because c is 2, plus delta x minus f of 2 divided by delta x. Now as we talked about earlier, uh, try substitution and you'll see that substitution of 0 in for delta x at this point is a bad idea because that'll have us divide by 0. So, And that will always be the case in, at first on these. So we are going to have to move on to uh, more uh, work being done to get that. Okay. So the function is 2x minus 3. So f of something means to put that something in for every x. So I'm going to replace x with 2 plus delta x minus 3. And that's the f of 2 plus delta x part. Minus f of 2 means I'm going to substitute into the f function for x with 2. Notice the parentheses I put after the subtraction sign uh, from the formula. That's to protect any binomial or longer thing behind it. You have to subtract the whole thing, not just the first term. Okay. So, now that we've done the substitutions into the formula, we're ready to simplify. So distributing, I'll get 4 plus 2 delta x minus 3. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 minus 3 is 1, so minus 1 over delta x. Continuing to simplify by collecting like terms, adding up all the constants in the numerator. 4 minus 3 minus 1 is 0, which leaves 2 delta x over delta x. And finally, that delta x in the denominator is something we can rid ourselves of by simplification, doing the canceling of the common factor of delta x, leaving 2, and the limit of a constant is that constant. Now, I want you to think about this problem. What is the graph of f of x equals 2x minus 3? Yes, it's a line. Do you know how to find the slope of a line just by looking at um, the equation? And this would be valid for any point on the line. Since it's a line, it's always the same. Right, it's the coefficient of x. And so you could have told me way before now that the slope of that line is 2, no matter where I'm looking, whether it's at c equals 2 or c equals 700, the slope of that line is 2. And we've just basically reconfirmed that. So that's not a big, um, huge discovery of something brand new to you. It's just so that when you look at this one, this one example, you can say, oh, that makes sense. That slope I knew was going to be 2 anyway. Now, uh, the only thing that this won't... Uh, really do well with is if you have a function whoops I didn't draw that very well let me try again that has a vertical tangent line I'm not sure I exactly got that right but let's say that the tangent line here is vertical whether my picture conveys that well or not um, if the tangent line is vertical, um, the slope is uh, not defined. So what we usually say is there's no slope for a vertical line. And so 
uh, that means that there's no number for that slope and our formula that we've established won't find it and so um, what we're going to have to do is something a little bit different because um, what's going to happen is if f is actually continuous and so let's assume that this function f I've drawn is continuous um, at c then what will happen when we try to do that calculation using our formula we'll be taking the limit as delta x approaches zero of f of c plus delta x minus f of c all over delta x and if it's vertical this answer will be one of two things it'll either equal infinity which is not a number or it will equal negative infinity and we saw infinite limits in an earlier section so we know that's possible and if that's what happens it's happening because you have a vertical tangent line at x equals c so that would be something to be aware of uh, if the limit doesn't exist because it's infinity or negative infinity the implication is that we have a vertical tangent line all right so but for every every other slope we'll have a numerical slope that we can gain from this and, and actually find it um, so um, now I'm going to define a process that we do in calculus um, which is finding the derivative so we're going to define what a derivative is here the derivative of a function is denoted by the name of the function prime of x that's what we call the derivative of f of x or another no notation that we will encounter is dy dx and that should remind you of delta y over delta x which is linked to slope so hopefully that makes sense um, the difference between change in y and dy and change in x and dx is that uh, dy and dx are called differentials dy and dx are called differentials and what they are are estimations of very small numbers they're estimating the actual change in y so dy is an estimator of the change in y and dx is an estimator of the change in x and we call those differentials and they're always very small numbers um, in what we're doing uh, and you can think of that as well de delta x goes to zero that means dx would go to zero as well and so maybe that helps you understand that and the process of finding a derivative is called differentiation so there are several vocabulary words that uh, you're going to encounter related to finding the derivative and this is one of them differentiation is the process by which you find a derivative and that's of course related to the word differential okay so hopefully that's that's something that's making sense all right so um, the definition of the derivative the definition of the derivative is you will get a function of x that is the derivative function of x um, which means that we could calculate uh, a slope of a tangent line using this derivative function by substitution and I'll show you that in just a minute but anyway let me first say what the the uh, definition of the derivative is it is the limit as delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x so instead of a specific number like c that we have in mind this is for any number that 
x could take on now just a specific value c like c was 2 in the last problem this is for all possible values of x that we could have minus f of and instead of c again it's x to be more generally true for a greater number of values all over delta x so this is what we call the derivative functions definition so the derivative of a function this is its definition provided this limit exists so um, if it does exist if this limit does exist then f prime will be a function of x okay so um, make sure that you see that the derivative of a function of x is also a function of x we'll see an example of this in a minute but make sure that that's um, clear in your mind and this new function that we derive from hence the name derivative that we derive from the original function will give us the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f at any point x comma f of x provided that the graph actually has a tangent line at this point another thing the derivative if it, derivative is used to determine is the instantaneous rate of change or more simply rate of change of one variable with respect to another to have you understand how that's related to what we've been doing um, let's say that we have a graph of somebody's trip that they took um, actually let me change the variable this is going to be time and this is going to be distance in miles from home is what that is and t is the number of uh, elapsed minutes well let's make it hours okay it doesn't really matter okay so um, you start at home at time zero and at first you're in residential areas so you're not going very fast and then you stop you stay there for a while whoops it looks like I went back that meant I meant for that to be horizontal um, and then you start out and you get on the highway and you're going pretty fast and then you get close to your destination you slow down when you get off the highway stop at a stoplight and then continue going until you get to the house where you're stopping okay so that is a rough graph of what I hope is understandably a trip from one place to another and let's say that this is uh, after three hours so time is in hours and the trip was uh, let's say 150 miles I made that an easy number uh, so that this is easy arithmetic doing that for myself okay so what was your average speed or in other words your average rate of change I know speed is a word that we're used to saying but I want to say rate of change on purpose because it isn't just distances and times that we'll be seeing treated this way. It could be volume and time. So it'd be the rate at which water is filling a swimming pool or something that we're interested in. Uh, so it doesn't have to be speed. So I'm going to say average rate of change uh, could be average rate of change of volume with respect to time. Um, so this is uh, the average rate of change of distance in terms of time and in order to do that what we need is um, our position and in calculus a lot of times for position we use the s function so this would be the position at uh, the ending time let's say minus the position at the beginning time and that means how far we've driven so our ending position was 150 our starting position was 0 which meant of course that we went 150 miles and we're going to divide the change in position the distance traveled by the amount of time it took so this we're going to take the time that we ended minus the time when we started to get the amount of time that elapsed between starting and ending and of course we drove for three hours that totally makes sense 
And when you do that division, you get that the average rate of change for this trip was 50 miles per hour. 50 miles per hour. So um, this is an average rate of change. And if we, I were to draw in points that I just used, this point when we started and this point when we ended, what we just found was the slope of the line that attaches those two. Because notice that's y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. That's the, the slope of a secant line is what that's like. So the average rate of change is the slope of the secant line, which we can find, and that's a nice pre-calculus idea, but we're way more interested in something else, namely, how fast are we going at this point in time? And so um, that is going to end up being the slope of the tangent line is going to be akin or related to the instantaneous rate of change, or just the rate of change. For short. Okay. So let me write another statement so it's very clear. The slope of the secant line, that's attached to the idea of the average rate of change. And the instantaneous rate of change is likened to the slope of the tangent line. Okay. So you can see how average rate of change, if we did a limit as delta x, or in this case delta t approach zero, we would be getting the slope of the tangent line, which would get closer and closer to the instantaneous rate of change. Think of it this way. If you could measure every foot, you've traversed a foot, and how much time it took, that would be a very short change in time that it would take you to do that. And so that average rate of change when you're traveling a foot in a car going pretty fast is not, you're not going to change much in that foot from uh, the beginning to the end of it. You're not going to be able to change your speed by much in the distance of a foot. So the average rate of change you could calculate there is pretty close to the rate of change you were going at the beginning of the foot that you just drove. And so you can make shorter and shorter and shorter lengths of time. So measure like a one second gap, how far did you go? A half second gap, how far did you go? And then calculate for each of those your average rate of change over one second, over a half second, over a fourth second, over a tenth of a second, etc. And you'll be getting closer and closer to the instantaneous rate of change because in that small time interval, you can't have changed your speed by, by very much from the beginning of the interval to the end of it if it's like a millisecond long. So uh, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense to you. So this is also used, this first derivative also gives you the rate of change, the instantaneous rate of change, um, which is like finding the slope of the tangent line to a curve. Okay. Um, we talk about um, a function being differentiable. So we're getting more vocabulary here. Differentiable means that the derivative exists. exists. So it's differentiable at a specific value of x um, when its derivative exists. When f prime of x exists. Um, at that particular x value. And um, if it's if a function is differentiable at all values of x on an interval, we can say that a function is differentiable meaning the derivative exists for every point on an interval. 
and we can say it's on an open interval from A to B, let's say. Okay, that means that at every point between A and B, uh, the derivative exists. Okay, so there are a number of notations, and I printed uh, in your notes some of these, um, some of which we'll use quite often, and others you won't see nearly as much as others, but that's okay. Um, the prime notation is this. Um, so that's its name, is that's the prime notation. It's called f prime of x, is the way you say that. So prime notation is a biggie. Um, dy dx notation for the derivative is also another big, biggie. And that one is actually named for a, a mathematician. Leibniz used this notation. He's one of the uh, discoverers or inventors of calculus. Uh, Leibniz is one of those. And this is his notation. Uh, instead of calling the function f, you could be referring to it as y. And so the derivative could be called y prime. That's another prime notation. Um, sometimes what we'll want to do is we'll want to say we want to take the derivative of something. So when you see this notation, this is like an operation on the function. This, op this means take the derivative of function f with respect to x, and the result is the derivative. And this notation, a lot of times, is especially useful in recording rules of differentiation that we'll learn later. And then the last one that's there, I'm not even going to write it down because I never used that one. Some older textbooks I know use that notation, but I doubt you'll encounter it. At least not from me, you won't. Okay, so um, the dy dx and f prime of x are the two biggies that we'll use a whole lot ourselves. And then uh, this one down here will be used quite a bit as an opposite of a way of saying take the derivative of function of uh, f of x. So those are the three biggies that I want to make sure you know. And they all are found using the definition of derivative that we uh, wrote above. Let me highlight that again. Uh, this is the definition right up here. And let me go ahead and put dy dx in front of f prime because you can use either of those notations and they mean exactly the same thing. So this is a very, very important thing I'm putting a box around. That's something you are responsible for knowing and you need to know it inside and out and very well, backwards and forwards. Okay, so let's use that definition of the derivative to find the derivative of this function. f of x is equal to x cubed plus 2x. Alright, so let's get started with this one. f prime of x is and at least for a while, I'm always going to write the definition down without any substitutions just yet so that you get a really good sense of what that definition is. So I would, if I were you, always write the definition first, like I'm writing. And then later, if you can keep that in your head and substitute in correctly without error, you certainly don't have to write this right hand side of this. You could instead write what I'm about to write. But for right now, please write that first right hand side as I did. Okay, so the first thing is looking at the function x cubed plus 2x, the first thing I'm going to do is substitute into that function with x plus delta x. So for every x, I'm going to take out the x and put the binomial x plus delta x in its place. So that's going to happen for x cubed and for 2 times x. I'm replacing that x with x plus delta x. Okay, that is f of x plus delta x minus, notice the left parenthesis here, it's very important, 
then just copy f of x down from what's written above. all over delta x. Now comes potentially some pretty intense algebra before we can actually assess the limit value. Um, so we're going to have to simplify. So we're going to cube that binomial. And now I hope you remember how to cube a binomial. If you don't, ask me in class how I did this. This is x cubed plus 3x squared delta x plus 3x delta x squared plus delta x cubed. That's the cube of that binomial. Then distributing the 2, that'll be plus 2x plus 2 delta x and then distributing the subtraction, that will be minus x cubed minus 2x all over delta x. And yes, I do want you to make that division bar go all the way from one end of the longer part of the fraction to the other end. In this case, the numerator is way longer. Make sure it goes all the way. Okay, then the next algebraic thing after we've done the cubing and distributions uh, is to collect like terms. Now, you could, and I hope you don't, see an x cubed and a minus x cubed. I hope you do do that. <laughs> I hope you see that. But what I don't want you to do is you look at that and go, oh, that is zero, and then do this and this, and I can't read what was there because I'm going to be grading that step, did you get that correct? And if you've obliterated that term uh, that canceled out to be zero, you haven't really helped me at all and you won't be able to get all full credit. So what I would suggest you do instead is maybe underline like terms as you're thinking about them. Those add up to be zero, so they're gone. Um, another thing that I see that is the same is 2x and minus 2x. Uh, besides underlining, you could use a check mark to say, yes, I've thought about that, I've done it. Then everything else that's left in that numerator, look at every one of those. They all have a common factor of delta x, which is kind of important, as you'll see in a second. So if I factor out that delta x, the first uh, remaining term after the underline things and check things are gone, if I factor out the delta x, I'll get 3x squared from the first one plus 3x times the other delta x. We pulled one away, leaving one, plus delta x squared. We took away one of them, leaving two, and then plus two, all over delta x. Now, of course, the substitution that we can't do early on because substitution into that fraction would make us divide by zero, the only way that that's going to become something we can deal with is if there is that common factor of delta x at some point that we can factor out and cancel, which is exactly what happens here. So that's a good result. That's what you're looking to see happen. If you don't see that, something's wrong, or perhaps you have a vertical tangent line, which is another possibility. So the delta x is canceled. Um, if you want to, you can you know, kind of highlight that that's what you canceled, because they're the same factor. Then, now that that delta x in the denominator is gone, try substitution. So that's going to be 3x squared, we're substituting delta x for every delta, I'm sorry, substituting 0 for every delta x, plus 3x times 0, plus 0 squared, plus 2. And that simplifies to be 3x squared, plus 2. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do with this information 
remember this is what our derivative is of our original function. So this is f prime of x. Notice it's a function of x in its own right. And what I'd like to do with this is I'd like for us to find an equation for the line tangent for the line that is tangent to for the line tangent to this curve so I'm going to write 2f which is this curve when x is equal to 1 okay so there are two things that we're going to use. I think I mentioned this before, but let me say it again. We're going to need to know a point on the curve to write the equation of a line, and we're going to need to know the slope. And once you have those two, the equation of the line will be y minus the y-coordinate of the point you know is on the line equals the slope m times x minus the x-coordinate of the point that you know is on the line. Now the point that's on the line that we will know is the point of tangency. And so when it says find an equation for the line tangent to f when x is 1, um, we need to find when x is 1 what the point on the curve is, what its coordinates are. So the y-coordinate for that point, let me call it y sub 1, will be the function evaluated at the x-coordinate of the point of tangency. In this problem, that's the number 1. Tangent to f when x is 1. So if we go back to the original function, which was x cubed, so 1 cubed, plus 2x, so plus 2 times 1, that's 3. And so that implies that the point we're going to use is 1, 3. Then the slope is calculated, and this is a notation I want you to learn. The slope is the first derivative evaluated at the point of tangency. In other words, it will be the first derivative evaluated when x is 1. So looking at our um, derivative answer right above, that will be 3 times 1 squared plus 2, which is 5. And so, therefore, the equation of the line is y minus y sub 1 equals m times x minus x sub 1. And that's the equation of the line. You may leave this in point-slope form. You need not solve for y. If you leave it in this form and have it right, yay, you get all the points. If you have this and then decide you just can't stand it and have to solve for y, that's okay unless you make a mistake. Then all the perfect points you had before you decided to do that, you'll lose some of them if you make a mistake in trying to solve this for y. I know algebra teachers in high school love for you to put it in y equals mx plus b form, slope-intercept form. Please don't. It's just more work and more chances for making errors. So please don't do that. All right. So um, let's see. Let's find the derivative of the following. Uh, so the first one, if f of x is 1 over x plus 3. Let's find the derivative. Oh, and by the way, uh, one of the reasons people like the prime notation is for what we just did. It's an easy way to say we're going to find the derivative when x is 1. By using that function notation, what's f prime evaluated at 1? And that's a good notation for that. If you're using Leibniz notation, on the other hand, to write that, like if I wanted to write f prime of 1 using Leibniz notation, this is the way you do that. You'll, you'll write, this is the derivative function dy dx. So dy dx is that 3x squared plus 2. Then we're going to draw a vertical line 
and that vertical line is to be interpreted as evaluate whatever's in front of that line for whatever I'm about to write down and to the right. So evaluate dy dx when x is 1. Those are the two notations that say substitute the number 1 into f prime or dy dx for each x and calculate the slope. And so those are both ways of writing how you'll get the slope. Okay, just wanted to say that before I got away from it. Okay, so see what, what you can do with this one. Put it on pause and see if you can at least start this by yourself. All right, let's see how you've done so far. So hopefully you remember to write either f prime of x or dy dx to start this. Doesn't really matter which one you use. Typically, if it's given to me as f of x, I use the prime notation. If they give me the equation in the form of y equals something, I'll usually use dy dx. Not that that's a hard and fast rule, but it's kind of what I, I think when I do this is a good thing. Anyway. The definition, I hope you wrote this down, of the derivative is the limit as delta x approaches 0 of f of x plus delta x minus f of x all divided by delta x so Next thing would be to substitute in to the function the binomial x plus delta x for each x. So this will be 1 over x plus delta x, which replace that x, the initial x, plus 3, minus f of x, which is the function as is. And since that's a single fraction, I don't have to have parentheses around that f of x part that I just wrote all over delta x. Now, um, this is what I refer to as a complex fraction, a fraction that contains fractions. And the way that I would ask that you learn how to deal with them is to multiply by a special form of 1. Multiplying by 1 won't change the value of that fraction. It will just change the way it looks. The form of 1 I want you to use is the common denominator of all the little fractions. So just to remind you, like if I had 1 seventh and 2 fifths, and I wanted the common denominator, isn't it simply the product of 7 times 5? So you multiply by this fraction by 5 over 5, right? and this one by 7 over 7. So the common denominator, oops, it's supposed to be a 7. The common denominator is the product 5 times 7, right? OK, so looking at the fractions that I have, the common denominator can be simply one of the denominators multiplied by the other denominator, just like 5 times 7 is multiplied up there to be the common denominator. So I'm multiplying by this form of 1. And just like multiplying the first fraction 1 seventh by 5 over 5, that form of 1, 5 35ths is just another fraction that's equal to 1 seventh, but in that form you'd be able to perform the subtraction in the continuation of that problem. Anyway, that's not what we're about. <laughs> Okay, so both of those factors that are written in pink in the numerator will be multiplied by distribution times the first fraction. So when I do that multiplication, the trinomial will cancel the trinomial, leaving the binomial. So the x plus delta x plus 3 cancels, leaving x plus 3. Minus, and now when you multiply both of those factors, by the second fraction, the x plus 3's cancel, leaving, notice the parenthesis now, x plus delta x plus 3. You could multiply that all out in the denominator. I'm going to suggest that that's not a bright idea. Leave it in factored form. 
by and large, that's going to be a better strategy for like 99.8% of the time. Don't multiply that out. You'll see in a second why that's not a great idea, at least not in this problem. Okay. All right. So, um, combining like terms, I have x minus x, which is 0. I have positive 3 minus positive 3, which is 0. So everything I've underlined is 0. And then you'll have 0 minus delta x, which is negative delta x, over this long, beautiful product. You notice sometimes I don't write that fraction bar long enough, so I have to adjust it. And by the way, that, that bar actually has a name. It's called a vinculum. A vinculum is a grouping symbol, uh, like parentheses or whatever. Uh, what it does in a fraction is it separates the numerator from the denominator. And so if you had like 2 plus 8 over 3, uh, order of operations, normally you do division first, but because of that grouping symbol, that bar, that means you're going to completely simplify the numerator and completely simplify the denominator and then divide. So it's a grouping symbol. It's also something that says what you're taking the square root of. So if you had this, um, you would group the 4 plus 45 together and do that first, kind of like parentheses would be, and then do the square root of that, and then do the subtraction finally at the end. So um, that's just a, a nice word for what that fraction bar is called. It's called a vinculum. All right, so if you look at our resulting fraction after combining all those like terms in the numerator, luckily for us, the delta x is now a common factor. And we can cancel them out. Again, don't obliterate them. Uh, I need to be able to see that. All right. Uh, so please don't obliterate. So that leaves negative 1 in the numerator and x plus delta x plus 3 to be multiplied by x plus 3. Now that that offensive delta x in the denominator is gone, it's offending me because I can't substitute 0 in there. Uh, now that it's gone, let's try substitution and see what happens. For every um, delta x, substitute in a 0. Well, that's good. That doesn't mean necessarily that I have a 0 in the denominator, except for when x is 3, of course. But um, anyway, when you simplify this, you get negative 1 over x plus 3 times x plus 3, which is more simply written as x plus 3 squared. So if you have repeated factors, please use exponents to express that in a more concise way. So that is the derivative of 1 over x plus 3. Okay. So let's do another one. If g of x is the square root of x minus 4, what is its derivative? Well, notice since it's called g, its derivative is g prime. Don't get too hooked on it always having to be called f. It's the most popular name for a function, but it's not the only name. So please uh, make sure that you know that this g prime is the correct notation for this particular problem. Okay, so again, I'm going to write the definition. It's no longer f, so I have to be careful that I realize that it's g of x plus delta x 
minus g of x all over delta x. And of course this could be used for any name of any function. It could be h of x, p of x, j of x, whatever it happens to be. Oops, we're going to probably run out of space. So I'm going to, unlike I usually do, is I usually want to have the equal signs kind of line up and go down the page. I'm going to string this out horizontally, which I don't think looks as good. And so I really don't want you to do it, but I'm doing it here to save space because I'm about to run out of room. Okay, so I'm going to substitute in for each x in the function with the binomial x plus delta x. So that'll be x plus delta x in place of the x minus 4 minus g of x, which is the square root of x minus 4 all over delta x. And to continue with this one, you might remember we talked about the rationalizing technique. Um, the form of one here that I would want to use is the conjugate of that a binomial expression. So it will be, I'm going to have to squeeze this in, sorry, um, x plus delta x minus 4. And the conjugate is, instead of a subtraction between them, the, its conjugate has a plus instead of a minus there. And of course, we're multiplying by a form of 1, so the denominator is exactly the same as the numerator. So I'm just copying what I wrote in the numerator. OK, so this will be the limit as delta x approaches 0. Um, the product of conjugates gives me a difference of two squares, which I've said this before, but I guess it doesn't hurt to repeat myself. If you're multiplying conjugates, you always get a difference of squares. It looks like that. So the first radical squared will give me, the square root squared gives me the radicand, the thing under the radical. minus the square of the second radical gives me the second radicand. Notice the parentheses I put around those to protect them. Over delta x times, well, I don't need that parenthesis, hold on, times the square root of x plus delta x Actually, I do need that parenthesis. I'm so sorry. I need a parenthesis there. Plus the square root of x minus 4. Because I'm multiplying delta x by that whole denominator expression written in pink. So I did need that set of parentheses in the denominator that I added kind of after the fact. All right. So collecting like terms in the numerator. I've got x minus x, which is 0. I have negative 4 minus negative 4, which is 0. And all that's left in the numerator is delta x. And of course, I didn't want to distribute that delta x in the denominator because I wanted it to be handy and right there for what we're about to do, which is cancel it out. And extend that vinculum far enough. Okay. So canceling the common delta x 
It's a common factor in the numerator and denominator. So this and this cancel. Um, we'll be left with 1 in the numerator. If everything else goes away when canceling, you have to leave a 1 there. Divide it by our first radical that has the delta x in it. plus our radical that doesn't have delta x in it. Now that that pesky delta x in the denominator has been canceled, let's try substitution. So that'll be 1 over the square root of x plus, substitute for delta x was 0, minus 4 plus square root of x minus 4. And the 0 in there, x plus 0 minus 4, simplifies to be x minus 4, which means that I have how many of those? I have two of them. Combining like terms, I'll have two times the square root of x minus 4. And that's the derivative of our original function, g of x equals the square root of x minus 4. Okay, this is a good stopping point because I've run out of room on this um, screen, so we'll move on to part 2 next.